Well, good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be here, a joy to see you, and uh, for those who are visiting with us today for the first time, we welcome you and trust that, uh, as with all of us, that we'll receive a blessing from uh, this uh, time together in singing and praying and then listening to what God has to say through his word. And this morning, I'd invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew, chapter number 24. I'll commence by reading the first three verses of this chapter, and then we'll get into the message itself. Matthew chapter 24, and beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, Then, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, Say, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, most of you are aware that I have been preaching through the discourses of Jesus Christ off and on for the last nine and a half months. And we are coming to the end of those, but these discourses, as I've defined them, are extended sayings or sermons that Jesus preached during his public ministry here on the earth. Some of them were spoken to individuals. Some of them were spoken to the multitudes that often gathered around our Lord. Some were spoken to his disciples privately and others were delivered to his adversaries, the religious crowd, the leaders of uh, Israel in that day, the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth. And uh, there are a number of discourses that are found in the Gospels. I realize that catalog cataloging them is uh, subjective, uh, depends on how you count them and how you see them. Uh, I have personally catalogued about 29 different uh, discourses and we covered most of those but in those 29 or so discourses that Jesus preached there are two particularly long discourses that I think are very notable and they're notable because for one thing both of them were preached on a mountain. Uh, for the first of them was at the beginning of the Lord's Galilean circuit ministry at, toward the beginning of his public ministry and the second was preached in the final week of his public ministry. Uh, the first of these is the great Sermon on the Mount as it's well known. You might recall back way back in the month of April we covered a lot of that found in three chapters in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 and this particular uh, sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, was spoken particularly to his disciples. He drew them aside from the multitudes and went up into a mountain and he began to teach them about the kingdom of heaven as it is now in its present form. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God into which all who are born again are placed and we are citizens of that kingdom. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord instructed his disciples about what it meant to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You'll remember the Beatitudes and the purpose of our life as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He also spoke about the demands of the kingdom, not in following the laws of uh, Moses as the Pharisees had burdened people with. He went beyond that and talked about the spirit of the law. And then in the last part of that great discourse, he challenged about the decisions that must be made in order to enter that kingdom, to enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the way that leads to destruction. And that was a great discourse. It's, one of, it's probably the, the most well-known and read of all of the discourses of Christ. Well, today our message is going to look at the second of these two uh, good disc uh, discourses that Christ preached and the one that we're looking at here in Matthew 24 is called the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. And the reason it's called the Olivet Discourse 
is because in verse number 3 of chapter 24, the Bible says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. And if you are familiar with the geography and the topography of the uh, region around the city of Jerusalem, uh, you have the city of Jerusalem that is uh, built on hills and then uh, across uh, the valley of Kidron, uh, there is the Mount of Olives. And uh, you can stand on the Mount of Olives and look on the city of Jerusalem or you can stand in the city of Jerusalem and look toward the Mount of Olives. And so this one was also spoken to his disciples. You'll notice in verse 3 again that as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. And it's always important that we understand to whom this discourse is being spoken because that gives us an understanding of what Jesus is teaching. And this one, of course, is directed toward his disciples. And it really does comprise two chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. The actual discourse is in chapter 24, but in chapter 25, the Lord, I think, extends the teaching on the future events by uh, giving the parable of the ten virgins. And then he gives the illustration or the parable of the three servants and the talents that they were given and how they used them. And then in chapter number 25 also, he talks about the judgment of the nations that will take place after the second coming of Christ. So really I see that there are two chapters that comprise this discourse of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we study this, we find that as the Sermon on the Mount dealt with the kingdom of, of God or the kingdom of heaven as it now is, and I trust that today you can affirm based on your Bible that you are a citizen of the kingdom, fellow citizen with the saints, belonging to the Lord. He is your king. He is your Lord, ruling and reigning in your heart. But one day, Jesus is coming again to establish an earthly kingdom. In fact, he instructed us in the Sermon on the Mount, in the so-called Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, that we are to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And one of these days, and the Bible talks about this in many ways, talks about the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And as we look at this discourse, it's speaking of the future earthly kingdom and the bringing in of that kingdom on the earth. You know, when we look at the Bible as a whole, about one third of the Bible, when it was written, was prophecy. In other words, it was writing about things that would come to pass. And many of those prophecies have already been fulfilled and when they are fulfilled, they are fulfilled with great exactitude. It's not like going to a Chinese restaurant and getting a fortune cookie and uh, breaking it open and finding out some statement there about your future that is usually so general that it could be applied to your pets as well. The Bible, when it pro gives prophecies, gives very much great detail. Uh, you only have to study the uh, 24 or so prophecies that were fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ in that 24-hour period when he was hung on the cross. The Bible prophesied that his hands and his feet would be pierced. The Bible prophesied that he would be beaten beyond recognition before he was crucified. The Bible prophesied that he would, uh, he would have, be sold for 30 pieces of silver. It even names that amount in the Old Testament. And we could go on and on, and one of the reasons that we have great confidence in the supernatural Bible, the Word of God, is because of fulfilled prophecy. But you know, of all of those prophecies that make up the Word of God, there are still about 75% that are yet to be fulfilled. What I'm saying is that there are more prophecies about the second coming of Jesus Christ than there are, or were, about the first coming of Jesus Christ. And if the first coming of Jesus Christ, the prophecies concerning that event, where he would be born and so forth, if they were fulfilled with such accuracy, then I believe we have every right to be confident that the prophecies of the second coming of Christ will also be fulfilled with great accuracy. And so 
Uh, in particular, these prophecies of the future have to do with the return of Jesus Christ, both coming in the air for his saints and then coming again to the earth with his saints and the establishment of the thousand-year kingdom on earth of our Lord Jesus Christ, a literal and a visible kingdom. These are all spoken of. They're still future. And I understand that we are living in days where people are concerned about the future. I've been asked on a number of occasions, do you think that uh, this pandemic that we're facing is the sign of the end times? Well, you could, I could understand how you would take it that way, but I, I can see that we know when the Antichrist comes that he will be able to control populations. And uh, it's not the mask of the beast, it is the mark of the beast. And uh, so we have to be careful about speculating, but the world is heading toward a certain destiny that is prophesied in the word of God. And we'll learn about that as we study this particular discourse. But there's a lot of interest today, um, and uh, as there were in the, in the days of Christ. And so we'll be looking at that, but, uh, you know, these futuristic prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled are scattered throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, it's it sometimes there are prophecies here that are double prophecies and so forth, and we, we wonder, well, how do we put that all together? Well, in my mind, there are some key prophetic books and passages that are essential to our overall understanding of what God has planned for the future. And uh, when you understand these basic prophecies, you can hang all the other little prophecies here and there and everything fits together and provides a framework for them. And so these three main prophecies, this is my... Uh, personal uh, understanding. Uh, you may think, well, there's other prophecies that are also important, and yes, there are, but number one is the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is so important, particularly chapters 2 and 7, which give the outline of Gentile world history, all of the nations. And uh, the Bible, Jesus spoke of that in Luke 21 as the times of the Gentiles. And so the book of Daniel gives us a broad framework of how there would be Babylon followed by the Persians, followed by the, uh, the Grecian Empire and then the Roman Empire and what would happen after that. That's key to understanding so many of the other prophecies in the Bible. And chapter 9 of the book of Daniel gives the prophecy of the 70 weeks which gives God's plan for his people, the Jewish people, from the commandment to rebuild the city, mentions the coming of Christ, being cut off, being crucified, and then that final seven-year period that is still yet to come. If we didn't have those prophecies, we'd probably be floundering, but thank the Lord that the Holy Spirit has included the book of Daniel, and it is certainly the key to prophetic interpretation. And then, of course, we have the book of the Revelation, that's an exciting book. So many Christians say, well, I can't read that. You can't study that. But, you know, with the book of Daniel, you can see how the book of the Revelation is the unfolding of that prophecy. And uh, particularly in chapters 4 through 22, we have all of the prophetic things that God says is coming, from the rapture, when the Lord comes back, to the eternal state and that wonderful place that we sometimes call heaven particularly in chapters 6 through 19. We have the unfolding of the things that Daniel saw but was told to seal them up. And now in the Revelation, God says to John, or to Christ actually, the Lamb unseals the prophecies and unfolds what is yet to come on this earth. And so we have the book of Daniel, we have the book of the Revelation, but number three in importance in my mind is this Olivet Discourse, particularly Matthew chapter 24. It's called the Anchor of Apocalyptic Interpretation. It gives us also a broad scheme of the future events. And it answers three questions that were asked of the Lord by his disciples. Notice again in verse number three, he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, and here are the three questions. Number one, tell us 
when shall these things be? Now that's a question that we all have on our minds. When are these things going to be? And by the way, Jesus answers that in verses 4 through 14, which we'll get to, Lord willing, next Sunday. Then the second question is, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? What shall be the sign of thy coming? Jesus answered that in verses 15 through 28. And then the third question is, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? When is this world going to end? And uh, the answer Jesus gave was in verses 29 through 31. The disciples were interested in the future, as many of us are. In fact, it was 45 days later, as Jesus was assembled there in the upper room with his church, that in Acts chapter 1 they said, uh, wilt, thou, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom uh, of, uh, to Israel? And Jesus answered them this way. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. I mean, they were wondering, well, when is all this going to happen? Jesus said, well, God's got that in control. And uh, then he commissioned his church to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. And that's where we find ourselves today. It's great to be interested in prophecy and we ought to know what is coming and have a clear picture of the way of, of the progress of humanity and all of that's important. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we have a job to do. And so as we get into this Olivet Discourse, obviously for the sake of time, we're not going to cover it all today. And uh, so you'll have to come back for the next episode, I guess. But what I'd like to look at here today is two things. Uh, and the first of those is, uh, and they have to do with the context. And I think that's always important in Bible study. First of all, the context concerning the circumstances that prompted this sermon from Jesus Christ. And then secondly, I want to look at the uh, a special point of context that's found in the sermon itself. So let's begin with the first point here, the prophetic context of the circumstances uh, for this particular discourse of Christ. And to do that, we've got to actually lift up our eyes and go up to chapter 23, which we covered briefly last uh, Sunday in Matthew 23 and verse 37. Here the Lord Jesus Christ laments over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. That's where it begins. And uh, here the Lord has just completed his scathing discourse against the Pharisees. You might recall that. And where did he speak that? Well, he spoke it in the temple complex, uh, the temple there in Jerusalem, not just the, the holy place and the holy of holies, but the, the structures, the buildings that were there in Jerusalem in Herod's temple at that time. Now, as the Lord spoke about the Pharisees and uh, warned the multitudes about the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. Um, he ended by saying, I've come time and time again and you will not listen, you will not receive the message. And so what did Jesus do? Look at verse 38 there in verse number uh, 20, uh, excuse me, verse number 37 and ver uh, verse 38. He said, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. If you go back to the Old Testament and the dark days of the Judges, you might remember that period right after the book of Joshua comes the book of Judges. And it was a day not unlike our own day when everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. There was no king, there was no governance, there was no leadership in the land. And it was a very bad time in Israel's history that was characterized by uh, turning away from the Lord and, and, and then God would send nations who would put them in subjection. Finally, they'd call out to the Lord and, 
and uh, God would send a, a judge to rescue them, but it was just an ongoing cycle. And one, in one of those, there was a time when the Philistines fought against Israel. And in that battle, Eli, the priests, two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. Uh, they, they died in that battle. And the Israelites had carried, as a good luck charm, the Ark of God. They thought, well, this is, this is going to win the battle. But instead, they lost the battle. Hophni and Phinehas were slain, and the Ark of the Lord was captured and taken by the Philistines. When the news of that defeat came back, the 98-year-old Eli, who was an overweight man anyway, fell off his stool and he died. And then his daughter-in-law, who was the wife of Phinehas, she gave an untimely birth. She entered into labour. The shock of that death of her husband was such that she delivered that child. And you know what she named the child? She named that child Ichabod because she said the glory is departed from Israel. That's what Ichabod means. And here in Matthew 23 in verse number 38, when Jesus walked out of the temple, he said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Ichabod was written over the nation of Judah or of Israel. That's exactly where the Jews are today. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, we find a portion of the word of God that deals with the blindness and spiritual nothingness of Jews in general today. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it does talk about those Jews who are saved. The Jews can be saved. But look down, if you will, at verse 7 and 8. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election, that is the saved, have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And the nation of Israel, Jewish people in general, and you'll find this out if you have an opportunity to witness to them and, and share the gospel of Christ, that in most cases they are very unresponsive and sometimes even antagonistic toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a spirit of blindness and that began when our Lord Jesus Christ turned his back on those people. He said in verse 37 of chapter 23, how often would I have gathered thee as a hen gathereth her chicks. How often would I have I reached out to you in salvation? And then he said, but now you're on your own. And the blindness continues, as we see there in Romans 7 and verse 8, until this day, or to this day. But back in Matthew 23 and verse 39, there is a very important prophetic word. In verse 39, Jesus said, I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth. But what's the next word? Till. Till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know, that word till, it's, it's a small four-letter word. And in our minds, a very insignificant word. But it's very, very weighted prophetically. Because it means that God is not finished with the Jews. God has not written them off. You see, there are those who believe a, a covenant theology that all of the promises to Israel are now belonging to, quote, unquote, the church. Uh, there is a replacement theology that's rampant today, even seeping into independent Baptist circles that the church has replaced Israel and God has nothing in mind for the Jews anymore. They are to completely not part of his plan. The Bible does not teach that. And that word till means that even though God is judging Israel and Jewish people in general for their rejection of Christ and there is a blindness, there's a, there, there are blinders on their eyes, they just cannot see the truth. But one day Jesus is going to come back and they will say, blessed is he 
that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the Bible agrees with this. If you go back to Romans chapter 11, in verse number 12, for example, the Bible goes on to say, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And then in verse number 15 of the book of Romans chapter number 11, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them? What shall that be but life from the dead? Verse 25 of Romans 11, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until, there's that word again, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a, the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So Israel will be restored. What an amazing thing. Uh, James spoke about that in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, Pastor James there in the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem at the time, in verses 14 through 16, Simeon, Peter hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them, uh, out of them a people for his name and to this agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. See, James knew the Old Testament prophesied that even though Israel would go into dispersion and there would be a blindness, that there would be a day when Jesus would come. We are living in the times where the fullness of the Gentiles is being brought in. We're all Gentiles here, unless I don't recognize a Jewish person, uh, but uh, the fact is that you're saved because, in, la in large part, because of Jewish blindness. And there is a fullness of the Gentiles. I don't know, maybe the next person to get saved is, is, we've reached the limits and now the coming of Christ will begin. I don't know. Isn't it great to be saved, Amen. to be one of those? So there is a time when uh, the Jews will turn to Christ. When is that time going to be? Well, the Bible says, when they say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Turn over to the Old Testament book of Zechariah chapter 12. I want to read a few scriptures here from the Old Testament prophecy and you can see the, the, the uh, lining up of these scriptures in Zechariah chapter 12 at verse 9. And it will come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they, that is the Jews, shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. In... Uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, this is talking about the coming of Christ. In that day there shall, shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin for, and for uncleanness. And what is that fountain? Well, look at verse number 6. And one shall say unto him, that is Jesus, what are these wounds in thine hands? And then shall he answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And one day the nation of Israel, in desperation, will turn back to the Lord and will see Jesus, whom they've pierced, and recognize that they have been rejecting their one true Messiah, who shed his blood for their sins. And then in verse 8 and 9 of Zechariah 13, it shall come to pass that in all the land saith the Lord two parts thereof, or therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call upon my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say, the Lord is my God. There you see 
the prophetic fulfillment of what Jesus said when he said, you shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 30, the Bible says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus spoke about these things in the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus spoke these words after he had left the temple. He walked out of that temple for the last time, went across the valley of the brook Kidron and up onto the Mount of Olives. And his disciples started to talk about all of the beauty of the temple. It was an amazing structure, pointing out the beauty of the buildings. And Jesus said, I'm telling you this, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. If you were to visit Jerusalem today, all that remains is what is now known as the Wailing Wall, which is part of the outer perimeter. Sitting on the Temple Mount is the blasphemous, wicked mosque of Omar. But one day, all of that will be changed. Jesus walked out. That context is very, very important for the Olivet Discourse. The second thing I want to mention very briefly now is the context from the sermon itself. And I, this point is, is a little more technical, but it's very, very important as it applies to prophetic interpretation. When people look at chapter 24, many have made some errors and, and mistakes in missing a, a point that has resulted in some uh, beliefs, uh, such as you may have heard this, the post-trib rapture. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Post-trib rapture simply means that Christians are going to go through the Great Tribulation. Now, I'll tell you, if Christians are going to go through the Great Tribulation, then we would be good to be survivalists. You better hoard up seven years of food because you won't be able to buy or sell. You think it's bad now. <laughs> go into a supermarket and have to mask up. But just imagine going through that Tribulation period that Jesus talks about later here. You better stock up on weapons because they're coming to get you if you're a Christian. Now, beloved, understand, and please, I'm not saying to do that because the Bible does not teach a post-trib rapture. The Bible teaches a pre-trib rapture when Jesus comes for us and takes us out of this world before all of that comes to pass. And I obviously don't want to get into that today, but why do people believe that? Well... If you look here in chapter 24, they, they find one word and they take it to apply to Christians. It's the word elect. Look at verse 22. Jesus said, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then down in verse 24, for there, sh uh, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And the thinking is, well, doesn't the Bible say that we Christians, we who are saved, are the elect? Yes, it does. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Peter, a, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and unto you and peace be multiplied. And certainly the Bible uses the term elect when it speaks of Christians. The word elect simply means to be chosen. And God has chosen to save anyone who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. For example, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 23, uh, the Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, and so forth. So, yes, the Bible uses the term elect to refer to Christians. And so the 
thinking is, well, if it talks here about the elect in this tribulation period, then Christians must go through that time. However, the Bible also speaks of the elect angels. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 21, it talks about the elect angels, the chosen angels of God. And here's another thing, if you're still in 1 Peter chapter 2, Jesus Christ is called the elect. Okay? Uh, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. Wherefore also, as it, it, it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, this is talking of Christ, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. Jesus Christ is elect. He's chosen. He was chosen of God. So what I'm trying to say is that you have to be a Bible student to interpret prophecy, not just to take a verse or a word and build a doctrine upon it. You need to do what the Bible says to search the scriptures and study to show thyself a, a, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, approved unto God. So when we look at that word elect here in Matthew 24, don't jump to the conclusion, well, that's referring to Christians because it could be referring to Christ, it could be referring to the angels, but in actual fact, it's referring to Israel because they're called God's elect also in Isaiah 45 and verse 4 and also in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. Israel is chosen. They're the chosen people of God. That's an important contextual consideration because it'll mess up how you understand the Olivet Discourse if you think it's talking about Christians when it's really talking about the Jewish people. The same uh, applies to another word called saint. Now in the, in the New Testament, Christians are referred to as saints. If you're saved, you're a saint. doesn't mean you're saintly, but the word saint simply means you're set apart unto God through Christ. But uh, in the book of Daniel, it talks about the Antichrist wearing out the saints. And if you take the fact that Christians are called saints and apply it there, then yes, Christians are going to go through this tribulation. But the word saints also applies to others, including Israel. So you've got to understand these things in order to uh, supply the, uh, to uh, have the, the right understanding. And the context here supplies the answer that these elect here in Matthew 24 are not Christians but Israel. How do I know that? Well, look here. Follow along in verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. That was a prophecy that was given to the Jews. In fact, God said in Daniel 9.24 that uh, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Thy is Daniel, Daniel's people, the Jews, and Daniel's holy city, which is Jerusalem. Look at verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Well, as far as I know, we're living in Oak Harbor, Washington, not in Judea. But you see, that's a Jewish reference. Also, in verse 20, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, the Sabbath day is Saturday, and we don't do anything on Saturday except chores and whatever else, but uh, that's a Jewish day. It was given to Israel. And so here in chapter 24, all I'm simply trying to point out for the sake of our future messages is that when the Bible speaks about the elect, it's talking about God's people, the Jews, during that time. Yes, they are going to go through this tribulation. In fact, it is referred to in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7 as a time of Jacob's trouble. God is going to have to bring his people through the terrible fires of tribulation, far worse than the Holocaust. In fact, two-thirds of the, of the Jews will be destroyed, but he has to do that to bring them to the place where they will once again look to the Lord instead of to their atomic and nuclear weapons and all of their military might that they have today. And when they look to the Lord, those Jews are going to see Christ and realize they've been fooled by this Antichrist, this false Messiah, 
and they'll call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Praise God, there is salvation for the Jews. And you know what? The salvation that's offered to the Jews is the same salvation that Jesus Christ offers to you and me today. Israel had a choice. They could have turned to the Lord in repentance and faith, but they chose to reject Jesus Christ. In fact, two days after this discourse, Jesus Christ was on the cross. They said, we will not have this man to reign over us. They said, away with him, crucify him. And he was put to death. You know, the same choice that Israel faced in this critical moment faces all men today. In fact, the Bible does speak of God forsaking men. Romans chapter 1 talks about God, gave, he gave them up to uncleanness. He gave them up unto vile affections. People can persist in sin and there'll come a time. Thankfully, I don't know when it is, God does. But when he says, you know, you've heard the gospel enough. You've heard it time and time again. And you choose not to believe, no more opportunities. Certainly when the rapture takes place, the hearts of those who've heard the gospel, the Bible says, will be hardened so that they will believe a lie that they'll all be damned, that they cannot be saved. What a horrible, horrible thought that is. What a horrible place to be in. But people reject Christ all the time. But to be rejected by him is far worse. And I would say simply in conclusion here today that if your personal need is a, that of salvation, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are born again the Bible way, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that you would turn to him while there is yet time. Don't procrastinate. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, and uh, we need to be ready.